uh, places in the world, those people don't just walk out. They're a conflict. It could be the last time you walk out of your house. You didn't have to worry about that. You're talking about stress. Can you imagine leaving your house and not sure if you're going to come back? We may not face in that level of stress, but it does affect us because it's part of the whole. It's the same world, except a different region. So who am I? I believe, both individually and collectively, we have experienced a crisis of identity. <laughs> You're like, who am I? The teacher, the professor, the counselors, the CEO, the millennial, the husband, the wife. Who am I? How do I deal with all this? And so I suggest that we need nothing short but a conscious revolution. We were talking about that. Well, somebody tell us, what do we mean by conscious revolution? There's two of you, you shouldn't say anything. You shouldn't say anything, because you were part of the conversation earlier. And there's someone else who was there. Conscious revolution, what are we talking about? Why do we need a conscious revolution? Now, I think the reason why many people are trying to refrain from that, because you're talking about the revolution, Mr. Pierre. <laughs> I don't want to be a main revolution because we have a negative connotation about the word revolution. But what if I remove conscious and put economic revolution? You probably say, yeah, that's me. I'm going to make more money if there's an economic revolution. <laughs> <laughs> if I change conscience to economic revolution, yes. Well, I think that in this day and age, people are so connected to their devices, um, and it so easily removes them from their state of being um, oh, from yes. themselves, and so it's sort of a distraction, really. Um, so to be able to look inwards and wow. to reflect, um, I think, is what you're referring to. That's correct, yes, to be able to go inward, because going inward is where we will experience the true self. The true pure consciousness. The true pure consciousness. Because as you heard, the consciousness is pure. There was no conflict, there's no competition. There's no need, there's no want, there's no desire, there's no envy, there's no jealousy, there's no competition. That's why the consciousness is pure. When we experience this deep consciousness, we really experience who I am. There's no fear. And most of all, there's no bill. I don't have to worry about paying a bill. When no one will meditate. No, don't go meditate and tell your creditors, well, Mr. Pierce, I can meditate my bill out. No, that's not what we mean. But in that experience, all the fears, all the worries are gone. And that's what we mean. So we need that conscious revolution and just what she says, so we can disconnect from those electronic devices and not just that, disconnect from some of the responsibility, disconnect from some of the fear and the worries that we have to experience the true self. And Thereby, only when we arrive there will we begin to realize that we are alive, we are existing, that's what we mean. We begin to discover what we call the, the mysteries of life. And there, we says, they are constantly, we are dealing with unfulfilled self. We're never satisfied. There's always one more thing I have to accomplish. There's one more goal I have to achieve. There's one more degree I have to have. Even in our personal relationship, we do that all the time to our spouses. No matter how many times he said he loves you, you're still going to say, honey, do you love me? You better say it right. No, I don't mean, yeah, do you? There's always this desire for confirmation, for affirmation. And there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. Well, there's this constant unfulfilled self. Dr. Nielsen and I were talking earlier before you start coming. We were talking a little bit economic. Uh, don't talk economic. Your blood pressure start going up. <laughs> Seriously. We we're talking about some of those CEOs who's going to get a check of, of $5 million for bonus. That's because he did great work in 2015. The company wants to appreciate and give him a, a bonus of 50 something million dollars. And then we have somebody who's going to take that information and put it in a magazine and tell you my read it. <laughs> There's a lot of them. One of them is the Forbes magazine, sometimes Time magazine will do one of those publishers. Every so often you pick a magazine, they tell you the 100 most rich people in the world. I don't read those magazines. I don't have anything against 
it's my privilege. I would mind try to be rich, just to have the experience. <laughs> that really doesn't seem the same thing. I just want to know what is feeling, and then come back here. You probably say, yeah, right. <laughs> Once you're rich, you never come back. But the idea is this this constant, unfulfilled self. And so therefore, you and I, we live in a culture where being busy, because people who have all this responsibility is very busy. And we want to follow them. We, we look at them, the people we talk about. Can you imagine a young person who's 24, she's 24, and she literally have thousands of people who's answering to her. You know how much pressure that is? She give lecture, and she talk about how she had no time to sleep. Because when she go home, she eat dinner and then, you know, talk with her family, blah, 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 and then she get back into the device. She's, she's on life. She's moving. She's shaking things. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of stress. And so we look at someone like this because of our unfulfilled self. We think, that's what I want to be. I want to be like her, like him. I want to be influential. I want to be a mover. I want to be a shaker. Yes, you can but not at the expense of the who I am, which is often what happened. Okay, so the unfulfilled self. And so the constricted self, what we end up having, we see stress is everywhere. Most of all, stress enter inside of us. It penetrates who we are. Everywhere we turn, there's stress all over the world. Where there's political conflict, diplomatic conflict, financial conflict, and then we bring it down to the micro, personal conflict, family conflict, children conflict, community conflict. It's all around and all over us. And so it's affecting our health, it's affecting our lives, in many, in many, in many ways. And as we uh, talked about earlier, um, one of the things that uh, uh, Dr. Nielsen and Dr. Parida. Parida and I were, I will get it, trust yeah. me, I promise. <laughs> one of these days, I'm proud of you. Okay, you got it. Dr. Parida was sharing with us is when we talk about the pure consciousness is when we really experience saying, not only the state of consciousness, but we begin to see how precious is this vessel through which life manifested itself to. It is through that life manifested itself. The body, it's a vessel through which life manifested itself. And we talk about the breath. But when we look at the nervous system and look at how stresses affect the body, we realize how stress affect particular organs of the body, from the lungs to a liver, it affects that. And so therefore, when we, one of the things stress is caused in the body, it causes it to be imbalanced. Because the minute the energy flow of your body is not flowing in a smooth, you are imbalanced. It's a matter of fact, in Ayurveda, if you go and see a doctor who practicing Ayurvedic medicine, which is another integrative Middle Eastern philosophy medicine, which is actually the true medicine. Ayurveda is just a Sanskrit word, uh, simply mean the science of life. That's precisely what it means. Actually, the majority of what we have uh, used in conventional medicine is taken from those old tradition, one which is Ayurvedic. If you were to come and see me, and you someone who open to what we call integrative medicine, and you want to integrate those traditional medicine into uh, your lifestyle for, for, for literally true healing, I wouldn't tell you you're sick. I would tell you you're in balance, because you are. It's the energy in your body that is in balance. And whenever there's imbalance in the body, it causes all kinds of things, from inflammation, which often be uh, a beginning of illness, to 
whatever the symptoms that you're going to experience in the body. So instead of saying, yes, I'm ill or I'm sick, we will see you in balance, which means we're going to find the source of the imbalance, not just dealing with the symptoms, which is give those uh, tradition, the essence as pure medicine and provide it through healing. Because in Ayurvedic medicine, we don't deal with the symptoms. We find the underlying factor that caused you to be in my office, and we want to deal with that. Why do you think that is? Not only do we not deal with the symptoms, why do you think that? But, yes. When you deal with the symptoms, you're just masking the problem. Just masking the problem, which is what we do. It's worked for a while, you're gonna to have to keep coming back. Because it doesn't deal with the underlying factors, it doesn't deal with the core, what caused the body to be in balance. And that's where we go. In addition to, from Ayurvedic point of view, I look at you as a whole person not part of you. So if you tell me you have shoulder pain, I'm going to analyze you from head to toe. Because the shoulder pain may have nothing to do with that particular location of the body. But just imagine one of our doctors, you go see him or her to analyze you because you say you have some shoulder pain. Today, one of our doctors in any medical facility is seeing 59 patients a day. Do the math. 59 patients in a day? It's boom, 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 boom. They have no time. If I go there and tell my doctor, I'm having some stomach uncomfortability, he's not going to say, well, how's your relationship with your wife? <laughs> with your stomach? What do you mean? You just, no, no, no. no. Said, well, don't you want to know? No, I don't want to know that. Let's deal with they probably think, okay, Mr. Pierre, I think you're avoiding the problem. No, I'm not. My stomach pain, probably I'm feeling, maybe I'm depressed. Do you believe if I'm having a depressive experience, it can affect my immune system? But see, we don't train our doctor to go there. He's going to give me something to drink or to swallow and then send me home and then go see the next patient. And we're not being critical of our doctor. They're doing the best they can. We create the system and put them in it. Yes? Well, actually, just to follow up on what you said about masking the symptoms, one simple example we give from, from the same lines is uh, imagining a fever. Uh, the reason the body temperature rises is to battle the bacteria of the bugs that are causing the infection, right? So that's a natural defense mechanism, which has been built over billions of years of evolution to get to the form we are in. So that slight rise in temperature doesn't affect the human body because it's too little, but that's devastating for the bacteria, so they get killed with them. But what do we do in conventional medicine, uh, Western medicine, is we give an antihiretic, which is to bring the fever down. Mm -hmm. So here, that's exactly what you said, is a masking the symptom. So it's a very temporary fix. It's like putting a bandaid on an open wound. So if you bring the temperature down by giving this, uh, this antibiotic, or not even antibody, antibody, you know, paracetamol, something like that. The temperature will come down, but the bugs will start spreading. Yes. So what you have done is by masking the symptom, you're actually spreading down the line cause. That Absolutely. It. So we have to be mindful of that. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And so we were talking about earlier how um, one of the movements that's been going on around the world and in, in our country, in the United States, is this movement of what we call a paradigm shift. The paradigm shift is uh, medical facilities, including mental health facility, are seeing and integrating these old tradition, things like mindfulness, meditation, yoga, aromatherapy, all those, uh, all these been used for, for, for thousands of years. Uh, I share with you about my grandmother. Uh, it, it's interesting, this woman, uh, I'm sure you probably have some, someone in your life that have influenced you. I hope you have in a family member. This woman was fascinating. Uh, Dr. Nelson, she didn't know how to read and write. She couldn't read and write. When she received a letter in the mail, one of us had to read it for her. But she knows the Bible from cover to cover. I'm like, Mom, how did you do that? Now she spent all her life in churches and listened to priests read the Bible. She, if I were to come home from school and I don't look well and I don't feel well, she would tell me, 
you know, go this way. Don't move your head. She, I said, that's what my doctor's doing. Now this woman was not a doctor. She said, go that way. Open your mouth. Go, ah. And she said, go sit down. I go sit down. She goes back in the backyard, come back with her apron full of a bunch of leaves. <laughs> yeah, literally. She's in the kitchen. She come up with a big spoon of ugly, green-looking <laughs> stuff. And she said, open it. I'm out. And then I'm out. That's it. In a few minutes. She knows every leaf in the backyard. She knows them by name, by looks, and what they do. When one of our assembly married and have children, she get them out of the hospital a couple hours later. She said, I'll take care of her. And she does. She used to do that. She will mix those water, those big leaves with hot water. And literally, she will cover them with, and all the boys, out. All of you, the husband, everybody out. She will massage the body. Big hands of leaves with hot water. We see her. And when that woman done, she's overpowered the joint and everything. And we men, we have no idea. We think we do, but we don't. I would even go there, what the body goes through. And this woman knows what to do. She didn't know how to read. She was using those ancient traditions. She was the doctor of the family. We didn't have money to go to the doctor, but anything, any one of us that's sick, we said, I'm going to go see mom. And she will take care of us. And so we need to know how stress is affecting our health. And we know that this world, the uh, uh, autonomic nervous system is our nervous system have those two component or two function, how uh, each of them, uh, you know, control uh, different organs in the body. Uh, I know we're looking at this, but someone, uh, don't be bashful the best you can. What's the difference between the uh, parasympathetic division and the sympathetic division? Why there's any difference in the two function? It's all one nervous system, but it function in this dual multi uh, function. What's the difference? I'm going to turn it into a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. We do have an MD here, so I better be on my best. Mm -hmm. yes. I'll give it a go. Yeah. Um, sympathetic is the, like the spinal column, and the parasympathetic is um, like all of the organs. So the, the thing is, Fight and flight to address the parasympathetic system to impact the sympathetic system. Yeah. You look at my husband, he can indignate me. <laughs> no, that's true. Our sympathetic is the part of the nervous system that reacts to things. Like when my boss said, uh, Mr. Pierre, I have a problem with your report. My sympathetic nervous system constricted and then speak to the organ and she can see I'm nervous. You can tell that's the fight and flight. And so that's what stress does to the body. One of the key elements of, of stress, it's literally biological and needful is cortisol. It produced in the body, which is a natural element. It's a natural hormone. We need cortisol in the body, but too much of it, it causes imbalance in the body, which is how it comes to be known as a stress hormone. That's not because it's bad, but because we force the body to create too much of it, and too much of it create imbalance, we call it stress. Now, on days, there's a lot of talk about wellness. I am into wellness. We're into wellness. Dr. Nielsen is into wellness. You all probably in wellness. There's wellness everywhere. Everybody is talking about gym and magazine, you turn on your TV, everybody's talking about wellness. There's a lot we can do to manage our well-being, well but we have to take personal responsibility for that to happen. For example, I shared this with the group yesterday. As you recall, one of the things I do when I do training for an organization is to ask them, is it possible for me to meet and greet the people I'm going to train? Remember, we talked about that. And the reason that is, is because I am removing barriers so we can get the most out of the training when I do it. And over the years, myself, when I go to training, trainers usually take 
five, 10, sometimes 15 minutes, introduce, notice I didn't ask you to introduce yourself, you just get friendly with your neighbor. You know each other, but it's okay to do that, but I like to get to the bottom of things. And if we were to do a meet and greet, I would give you some instruction. I would tell you tonight, the night before the training, would you please don't drink any caffeine. If you have medication and a doctor's provision, please take them. But before you go to bed, I want you to drink a tall glass of cold water. What's the meaning of that? What would be the purpose of me not thirsty if this guy goes to drink a tall water? Why would be the reason I say that? Cleansing would be one. Stay hydrated. Stay hydrated, yes. I'm not sure about in the evening, but I believe that in the morning when we do that, it's supposed to help jumpstart your organs. Yeah, that's, that, that's what I would tell you to do in the morning. Correct. That tall glass of cold water, tell the body, don't put those kudos on. Reduce the amount. When you get up this morning, it was because of that involved in your awareness, letting you, I need to get to work, I need to get ready, I need to hit the shower, it's a very important part. And when you get up in the morning, you'll do the same. I will tell you, drink the same amount of warm water before you come here, avoid any caffeine. Now, I get myself in trouble. So you say, no, Mr. Beer, I will drink my caffeine. I know you meant well, I said, go ahead if you must. But the idea is, is to bring the body in a state of um, awareness, keep it pure, a little bit cleansing, the way you say to cleanse the body, because the more we clean the body, the more balanced it is. So be mindful and be aware of how stress is affecting how the environment we create affecting our body is very important. And as we talk about of the immune system and stress, this is how it affects the whole body, each one of the components. And those parts are very, very, very important to all of us and who we are. It affects us particularly. And this is why I say to you, so that if I were to go to my doctor and I say I'm having a knee problem, it probably has nothing to do because of the squat I did at the YMCA yesterday or because I ran. It probably had to do. I'm under a lot of stress. There was a time I used to go to the gym because I was stressful. And I go there and then take my stress out of the middle of the eye and lifting weight. It's interesting, as I'm getting deeper into the research and study how stress is affecting my body, now I'm going to the YMCA as enjoyment. I enjoy being at the gym, enjoy my workout, because of you, right? She is. <laughs> Are you a gymnast? I am. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Goes to the gym for enjoyment, because it's good, you know? But, but and again, it's okay if you are under stress, I can work out, and we advise that it be a good thing to do to work it out. But we need to be mindful how stress affecting each part of the body, okay? Let's stop here, and let's take a, a 10 minutes break, and then when we'll come back, we'll continue. Thank you. You can put your shoes on. Okay. <laughs> I think I read about yes. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. This is a just the way we bump into each other. This really looks like it's beautiful. I know you used the word bump, but I think it was meant to be. The energy is bringing because the energy is it, it's it's it connect it's unite it but it bound to happen. It cannot be so divided. If any obstruction causes it, yeah. it will it, it bring itself right, right, back into. Right. So all it's gonna place. it's gonna pull all of us. All the jigsaw puzzle pieces, they all get absolutely, together. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You wanna say something? Yes. Come on. Um, hi, I'm Hannah. Sorry. That's okay. That's right. I'm really enjoying the presentation. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Thank you. I was wondering if you had any. Yes, we were, we were just talking, uh, Dr. Yeah, Parisian. To, yes. to another gentleman here, he was more interested in learning about quantum science, and things that do with the human body. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. 
Madison. Yeah. And indeed, what people live from And thus, I call it the mysteries of life. Mm -hmm. yes, the mystery. So, how did you get into this? Uh, oh, well, that's a little bit question. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, no, I would be glad to share with you. Uh, meditation was introduced to me. I was studying to be a priest uh -huh. uh, in, in the Catholic Church, and a uh, priest is a very isolated journey. Mm -hmm. You would be by yourself right. the whole time. Well, something with other student priests and meditation was introduced uh, to me by Haiti. Then I went to Canada to complete my study, and that's when I got into the philosophy and got into the middle religion and understand that what the Catholic Church was teaching me. It's something that is thousands and thousands of years old from Romania, from China, and I really got into it. And then I realized the only way to really not simply know the or the theory of it, something to practice, and that's why I choose the field of being a counselor. Because what I was experiencing, one of the things we do as a priest is the confession. Right. But we're not allowed to use any type of method for the donation. When they confess to us, we're supposed to give the people a solution, not a forgiveness of sin. Right. But then when I went to San and in philosophy and sociology, I realized we can actually get help. Mm. And then so I chose that field. But then the spiritual experience I was having was that I realized the people who was coming and confessed the sin is the same thing those people who was coming and sharing with me with the mental stuff and the psychology. Mm -hmm. Then I realized I have to be a medium to which when I can bring the two of them together. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to school and started studying all that. Yeah, that is that is the Good. Yes. 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 That's the way to prevail. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So you think about it. And now I'm just going to get a little bit of a law. Yeah. 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 Can you imagine that? So that's a question for Okay, let's resume. Thank you. The next thing we want to briefly share, I usually, I usually use uh, essential oil uh, when we do uh, those training. And remember, it's the way of helping us to uh, focus on the here and now. You really will not get much from the training if, if all you get out of it it is the theoretical, the analytical, the intellectual part of it. Uh, those trainings are designed to really uh, help you to 